We go on April vacations, uh, April 9th. The end of the marking period, I believe, is April 8th. So in order for me to get these grades in, you need to make all your corrections by then. Cell phones, put them down and away. They are already graded. They are not in power school yet because I was giving people time to make their first corrections. They will go in power school on Friday. Once they are in power school, you still can make corrections up until that first week in April. <clears throat> if I put anything else in this section, you'll be able to correct them. I don't think for this marker period there will be any other correction assignments, but maybe. This week, I posted today a rational cheat sheet. We're going to briefly go over it. We won't really get into it and probably until next week. But that is something you're going to use throughout this unit. <clears throat> Your new packet is posted. Again, nothing is due at the moment. It's up there. We're going to use it today, and it's there for you to view. The assignment, your first assignment about Women's Month is up there. The next class, I will be introducing the Mark Period 4 project. It will connect to Women's Month. <clears throat> Buy, sell, hold, the stock assignment that's due today. We're going to go through it today, and then you can finish it. This vocab test that's due Friday, only three people turned it in. So you might want to get that done. That is included in your grade. Um, polynomials test, test corrections are due on Friday. I believe that's what I have put for you guys. I did put it on Google Classroom. I don't remember exactly what I said, but I think it's Friday. So make sure you have your test corrections in. All right, because today is tomorrow's three, four, five. This one is seven, one, two. Oh, no, so Monday. So I don't think I see you on Friday. So your next class we have together, that's when your test corrections are done. If they are not handed in at next class, no matter what the reason, you will not be able to update. You will get the grade that's in there. Credit recovery, at this point, everybody that needed credit recovery should have reached out to me. There's one person I'm meeting with on Friday, so if anybody else would like to meet, you can on Friday. I will not be in tomorrow. I'm not meeting with anybody tomorrow. It's my day off. Don't write me. I'm not going to write you back. That was said with love. See you on Friday. Questions about your Google Classroom assignments. If you have fallen behind in this class, today we start something new. So this would be the time to take out your notebook, pay attention, ask questions. Start something new that you haven't done this year. So actually ask the question. Don't wait until the day before the test to ask me a million questions. Don't wait until you get home and you're on your email and you want to email me a question. On Google Classroom, Miss, I just want to ask you privately. I understand your nerves, but you got to kind of get through those because the best way to answer math questions is in math class, not via email. So this is the moment. Take out your notebooks. Let's get prepared to be great students. Those of you on Zoom, I'm going to be writing on the board today. The new unit is called the rational, yes, yes. It's called rational functions. Have a pencil. So those of you who are on your phones and or computers, you might want to put those away so you can actually pay attention, so that you can pass the third and the fourth marking period.
All right. So the first pages, one through eight, we are not going to, I'm not going to require you to do them. I might at the end of the unit give it for some extra credit or something. However, I am going to go through it. It is an Algebra 1 skills that I'm sorry if you don't know, so we're going to go through it briefly. <clears throat> Those of you on Zoom, if you can't see or hear something, please just let me know. So direct and inverse variation. You are familiar with direct variation. You don't call it that, but you have done it time and time again. Direct variation is just something with a steady change. It's a linear function. And it looks like y equals k times x. The graph. looks like a basic straight line where the change if it goes up by one here then it goes up by one here and so forth it's the same steady change <clears throat> where k represents what it changes by what's that also called what are we used to that being called the what what it changes by so that's what s Something in algebra one. That linear equation changed by the what? No? Went up one over one? Rise over run? Nobody knows what that's called? Oh, slope. slope. So that change is also called the slope. That's what you're used to hearing. It's the rate of change or the slope. And it has to be the same rate of change for it to be direct variation. You can't have something plus or minus, added or subtracted, because then it changes the <clears throat> way the graph changes. If I wanted to figure out what k was, so if this is my original equation, and I wanted to solve for k, what would I have to do? So if I said 4x, in order to solve, you'd have to do what? If this was 4x and I wanted to get x by itself, what would I have to do? Seriously? Nobody? Huh? Divide by? Four. So then here I have k times x. What am I going to divide by? K. K. <clears throat> but I want k by itself. So what am I going to divide by? I want k by itself. So what am I going to divide by? X. So if I wanted to solve for k, if I wanted to know what the change is, I had to do y divided by x. So this is called direct variation. The other way Can you just move the um, camera up a little bit? Say one more time. Can you move the camera up a little bit? Is that better? Thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> so the other type of variation is called inverse. And it's the opposite type of change. The graph itself would be rational. That's the graphs we're going to do. And it looks like k divided by x. The graph will have a break in it. They generally look something. <coughs> like this. They have two parts to them. <clears throat> and now, so for a rational, if I want to solve for my change, now what I do? So think about if I had a fraction. This means division. So the inverse operation to solve would be what? Opposite of division is? Multiplication. Multiplication. So now I have to multiply the x times y to find my k. <coughs> These are important for equations. Again, we won't do a lot of these. 
I just want you to know what it looks like when I refer back to it. This is how the sentence is usually written. Find the constant of a variation k if y varies directly with x. It's telling you that y is the thing that's varying and that x is directly, so it's going to be multiplied by k. And then you would substitute values then and solve. Questions? But our race is everybody good? <clears throat> so looking at relationships, you should be able to tell whether they're directly inverse or they don't relate at all. Okay? So the amount of salary you make and the number of hours you make. What do you have to do to figure out your salary? If you know the number of hours you make, you have to do what? No, no one's ever got paid or know anything about getting paid? What do you do? You work 10 hours, how do you figure out how much money you're gonna make? How many hours you work. Okay, and you need one other factor. How much you make, how much you make right? So what do you do with that number? You divide it, you take the amount of money you make and divide it by the hours? Yeah. That's not how it works. How do you know what your paycheck is going to be? Yeah. Multiply what? Yeah. By the hours. So usually you make an hourly wage, right? So they don't use it. most of you don't work by salary, right? Probably not. So you're not, they're not going to say, hey, you're going to make $300 a week. They're going to say you make $10 an hour. Right? So you take your hourly K, this is your K, times how many hours you make, and that's going to give you your salary. So this is directly related. The, hour, the salary you make varies directly with the hours. Does that make sense? The next one, the faster your speed, the less time the trip takes. So what does your speed do to the time it takes, the trip takes? So if I have to go somewhere and it's going to take me three hours, do you multiply or divide that to figure out that? What does that speed do? Increase. It increases? By the time, like how fast you're going. Increases the time? Your speed, like it says, the faster your speed, the less time the trip takes. So basically it's saying the faster you go, the less time it's going to 
Okay, so I need a I need a mathematical operation. S equals ST. ST, so you take your speed times the time. Oh. If it takes me three hours to get somewhere and I'm going 60 miles per hour, I do three hours times 60 miles per hour, that's gonna get my total time? Absolutely not. What do I do? Divide. Divide. I am gonna divide. <laughs> so I'm gonna take my time, I'm gonna divide by my speed. And so this is going to be very what? Is it going to be directly or inversely? Inversely. Inversely. So this is inverse variation. This is inverse variation because you take the amount of time it takes to get there, you divide by the speed I'm driving. Broke it, I have a switch. Does that make sense? I don't really get the difference between the two. Okay. So one's multiplication and one's division. In order for you to find your salary, you have to multiply the hours you work by yourself, by the money you make a month, a week. You gotta multiply that. In order for you to get the time it takes somewhere, that's how driving works. It's miles per hour, right? So you have to divide that miles per hour. So once it's division, then it's inverse. That make sense? That's the difference. One's multiplication and one's division. Anybody else still confused? That's all I want you to understand right now about inverse and, di inverse and direct. That the direct variation means it's being multiplied. Inverse variation means it's being divided. something from Celsius to Fahrenheit, I don't remember exactly this. Let's see. I think it's 5 over 9, no, I think it's Fahrenheit. Um, 32 degrees, no, it's Celsius, so I had to buy. 32, I think it's something like that. I think it's something like that, right? Is this basic multiplication or basic division? Tell me what's happening in this function. What's happening? Um, this division. There's division, this, this fraction, and then what's happening to this fraction? What's, the, what's happening? Yes? You're multiplying it and then you're what? Okay, and what's, so what operation is that? So that's what it asks. Subtraction. Subtraction, right? So we got division, we got multiplying, and we got subtracting. So is this direct, inverse, or neither? Yeah. Neither. Why? Because you're doing like maybe all of them. Yeah, because you're doing like all of them. You're doing too much, right? So this is neither. Direct has to be simple multiplication. Inverse has to be simple division. Now you can have something use direct and inverse at the same time, but you can't add and subtract. That changes it. It becomes neither. Once you start adding and subtracting, it becomes neither. My phone is going crazy today. I don't understand. Yes. So you wouldn't have to ask your like, phone thing, you just have to write if it's direct. I'm not making you do anything on these pages, but take notes. You don't want to do anything. Page one through eight, you're just taking these notes. If I was making you solve them, there would be something that's, right now, it would just be telling me if it was direct, inverse, or variation. There's nothing to solve. Questions on that? You can also tell variation from graphs. Direct, remember, are linear. Inverse, have breaks in a graph. Neither, 
are like multiple polynomials. So neither would be like a quadratic or a cubic or a fourth degree quartet, right, or higher. So the first one, this has a break in the graph, so it's going to be inverse. The second one has some curve to it, so it's going to be neither. <coughs> if I could spell. The last one is a linear graph, and it's going to be direct. Yes? Say it one more time. No, I just want you to understand it. The packet's on your um, computer already. I just want you to understand it right now. So for 13, would this be linear? I'm sorry, would it be direct, inverse, or neither? Yes? Direct. 14. Inverse. 15. Inverse. Okay. Inverse. 14 looks a little bit different than the two that we already had, but it's still inverse. There's still a break in the graph. Because they have those curves. Because they have those two curves. They're called branches. We'll get to some fun vocabulary later. Questions? Anybody confused and need some clarification? We're good? We're not going to do tables because tables is a lot of calculations. This is more equations again. All right, page five. So rules of exponents. Something we went over towards the beginning of the year. Something hopefully you did in algebra one, which a lot of you kind of looked at me like I was funky when I said it at the beginning of the year, so I don't know if you did. However, I told you you will need them and they will come back. So if you don't have the rules of exponents, you need to put them somewhere. This is something you put on a note card. The rules of exponents something you put on a blue book. If you need a blue book or a note card, I still have plenty on my cart. Right? This is something you should use so when your quizzes come up. Yes. Yes, you can. <coughs> Uh, what page is this? Say what? What page is this? Page five. Five? Right. Yep. So, rules of exponents. <clears throat> when you have two things, having the same base and being multiplied, what do you do to the exponents? You have two things, they have the same base and they're being multiplied. What do you do to the exponents? Somebody talking? So if I have exponents, same base but being divided by, what do I do to them exponents? Nope. Oh wait, you still have? Nope. Yep, somebody said it. Subtract them. You subtract the exponents. So you'll have x to the 7 minus that 5 would give me x squared. If I had x raised to the 0, what's that equal to? X raised to the zero. One. What's the same thing? 
Would this just be x? No, it'd be 1. 1 and x are not the same thing. 1 and x are not the same thing ever. That's a big confusion everyone has. 1 and x are not the same thing. x can be 100, x can be 12. If I said I had 4x, x is some variable. This can be like $4 for every pizza. I can have 10 pizzas, 12 pizzas, 13 pizzas. x is not 1. So it would be the number in front of it? Nope, it's just one. If any number raised to zero, so if I had 250 raised to the power of zero, it's going to be equal to one. Negative 125 raised to the power of zero is only going to be one. Anything raised to the power of zero is one. X raised to the power of one. What? Your nose running? Whoever's mic is on, can you turn it off? X raised to the power of one. Anything raised to the power of 1 is itself. So if I had 35 raised to the power of 1, it's going to equal 35. So x to the power of 1 is x. Negative exponents get flipped. Same thing if that negative was on the bottom. Then it'd be flipped to a whole number. So it gets flipped and then it changes to positive. And I think that's all of them. So those are the rules of exponents. <clears throat> so when I apply that to this problem, the first thing I have to do is the numerical values. So I have 5 over 30. What is that fraction simplified to? Six. Not just 6, because it's not 30 divided by 5, it's 5 over 30. Do we not have reduced fractions? 6 is a part of it. Over 2. Oh, oh, what am I doing? Tell me 1 over 6? Yep. I mean 1 over 6. They're simply reducing that fraction. Now you're going to take the x values and then you're going to take the y values. So my x is, I have x to the 6, and this is division, so it's going to be subtract that fourth. So I'm going to say that again. I have x to the 6. I'm going to subtract that bottom exponent, which is a negative 4. But a negative and a negative make a what? Positive. Positive. So I have 6 plus 4, which is 10. 10. So I have x to the power of 10. Now I'm going to take my y's. And I have y to the negative 4 minus 5. They have the same sign, so you add them and keep the sign. Negative 4 and negative 5 are going to be? You add them and keep the sign. Yep, so add them and keep the sign. Negative 9. So this becomes y to the negative 9. I don't want a negative exponent, so I have to flip that to the bottom to make it positive. And that's because of my rules of exponents. This is why knowing rules of exponents comes in handy.
Questions on that first one? <clears throat> We're going to be doing a bunch of those. Two, this is multiplication. Again, I take my numerical values and I just multiply them. Five times two is? Ten. And now I have to take my x values. So I have x, negative two. We're going to add the x values because it's multiplication. So negative two plus five is? Negative three. Ne you keep the bigger number. Positive three. So I have x to the positive three. Then I have y to the third plus eight. So that's going to be y to the what? And that is using my rules of exponents. All right. Before we go on to page eight, I just want to briefly show you this cheat sheet. This is not something you're expected to understand as of yet. I just want you to know what rational function features have. So rational functions... They have two types of breaks. One is holes in the graph. And so holes look like a graph literally with a hole in the graph. The other one is called an accidental. And so an accidental is one where you have the two branches and they never cross over an asymptote. This is a horizontal asymptote. And then there's a vertical asymptote. So there's horizontal and there's vertical asymptotes and then there's holes. Those are key features in a rational graph. So when we get into the pictures of the graph, which I'm about to get into, I'm going to say the words asymptotes often. It simply means a break in the graph. So an asymptote is an imaginary line that is a break in the graph. Say that again because that's a vocabulary word. An asymptote is an imaginary line that's a break in the graph. Asymptote, imaginary line that's a break in the graph. Thank you, Matthew. 
So, <clears throat> anybody remember what this is called? No? What type of graph gives you this form? Or is it a quadratic unit? What type of graph is this one? Starts with a V. Who, what? Polynomial. You said polynomial? No, polynomial. Oh. A what? A vertical graph? No. Vertical means up and down. No? We don't know what kind of form. There's two different forms you can write a quadratic in. Definitely didn't study well. A oh, vertex. Thank you. Vertex form. Oh yeah, I remember that. Vertex form. And remember that each little parameter. So this A, this H, and this K all did something different to the graph. It all changed the graph somehow, right? So if we recall. This H, it was inside change. What did inside change affect on the graph? So here's my graph. I don't know why I keep doing that. Here's my graph, right? Let's say my uh, parabola looks like this. What did that H change? The X or the Y? You can clearly see what it's adding or subtracting to. No? Yes. It changed the x. So it changed my x value. Right? And this is my x value. So it made me go in what direction? What direction does my x value go? What is this? Really? We don't... Huh? What? Somebody... Horizontal, yep, so this was horizontal change. What else is it called? What, what direction is this? If I walk this way, if I walk this way. Oh my goodness. This is my what hand and my what hand? <laughs> left and right. It went right or left, left and right. Woo, that was really hard. It changed the direction of the graph by shifting it left or right. Do we kind of remember that? Nothing? We just no, all failed those tests? Because they were on the last two tests. We've been doing this all year. Left or right change. The x-axis goes left and it goes right. We just did in behavior, remember? The right side of the graph affected the x and the left side of the graph affected the y. Hopefully. Me in class by myself. So then the K, what kind of K change did it do? What did it do? You remember what that outside change did? There's only two things that can change in the graph. So it changed the what? The H changes the X. The K changes the Y. Y. Ooh. Man. We are not going to get to our stock assignment today. I can already see that. So that Y change is called what? Which direction is it going? Up and down. Woo, yeah. So that's my vertical change, which is up and down. Hopefully we remember that, because if not, this unit's gonna be much harder. You might wanna go back and look at those notes. Your A. Do you remember what that A did? Think about when it was negative, or we compared when it was a fraction compared to when it was a whole number. What did it do to the graph? You don't remember? When that A was negative, so when it was a negative sign in front of here, what happened to the graph? What does it look like differently? If this was a positive graph, what did the A look like? The opposite. The 
opposite, right? And so it's called, it starts with an R. What is it called when it does that? Who? A reverse. Not a reverse. Remember we had to write all the steps and it was negative. It did something with an R. No? Rational. We never rationalize a graph. <laughs> you just making up words now. Reflected. Please tell me we remember that word. When the graph was positive, this would be positive. It reflected, that would be negative. Yes? Right? It also stretched. You remember sometimes it was wider compared to when it was narrow? Yes, a little bit. So those same parameters are going to happen on a rational function. So when you have a rational function, it's inverse change. So all rational functions are inverse change. All rational functions are inverse change. <clears throat> and the same parameters happen. When I want to change my x. What does that say under reflect? Stretch. All right. All right. So when I want to change my x, still going to be down here with my x. When I want to change my y, it's going to be outside of my equation. When I want to change my a, when I want it to reflect or to stretch, it's going to multiply to the top. The letters will look different when we get into them, but that are the, they're the same parameters. My H affects my X, my K affects my Y, my A affects my Y, but it affects it in a stretch or reflection. We're going to look at some graphs. So our first rational graph is our very basic rational graph that you can't see because of the way this projector is. So I'm going to rewrite it. So this equation is x over 1. Let me make it in that color. And so this is my basic parent function. Remember we had parent functions? This is my parent function. It means it's the original function with no change to it. So my rational graph, that is inverse variation, and this is my parent function. Those are all statistics. So if I put this up on a question, hint, on Go Classroom, and I said, tell me everything you know about this. This you know is a parent function, you know it's a rational graph, and you know it's inverse variation. Those are all things that you know by looking at it. If I didn't tell you anything else. I also know that the only points that are identifiable, if I had a table, this is when k equals 1, because that's my k, it's varying by 1. And the only points are my 1 and my negative 1. The rest of my graph continues and it never touches 0. It never touches any identifiable points. So the rest of those are just fraction points. It's not that they're not there, they're just fractions. My asymptotes. My asymptotes are still 0 and 0 because there's nothing being added here. There's nothing being added except over here. My k is 1. Therefore, my a is 1. Okay? My next graph.
is 4 over x. So this is no longer a parent function because it's being stretched. My k is now equal to 4. My points, I have 2. What are my factors of 4? What are my factors of 4? 2 and? And 4 and? 1. Oh, 1. <laughs> Woo, girl. So 1 times 4, 2 times 2, and 4 times 1. And then I have my negative values. Those are the points. So my factors are my points. There's still nothing added. So my asymptotes are still the same. Okay? So the next graph is 6 over x. So without me showing you it, right, is it six? Yep. Oh, negative six. Let's try to identify the points before we see the graph. So I know that my k is a negative six. Let's ignore the negative at first. What are my factors of six? One, three, six. One, three. Six, we're missing something. Two, one, two, three, six. One, two, three, six. So one times six, two times three, three times two, six times one. However, that, that negative, right? When that A is negative, is that change on your X or your change on your Y? On the A? When that A is negative, does that change your X or your Y? Is that inside change or outside change? Was it inside the parentheses or outside the parentheses? Outside. Outside. Outside change always affects my X or Y? X. Y. Y. My outside change always affects my Y. So that negative is only going to affect my Y. So whenever you have a negative for a rational function, do all the values for the positive, and then take that negative to the Y's. And so now I have to plot my points. So I have 1, negative 6, 2, negative 3, 3, negative 2, 6, negative 1. Uh, negative 2, 3, negative 3, 2, negative 6, 1, negative 1, 6. What are my asymptotes? What's being added here? Still what? Is it x plus something? Zero. Zero. And then outside change? Is there any outside change? Anything here, people? No. Everyone should be able to see that. Is there anything being added out here? Maybe? Yeah, plus zero. Plus zero. There's nothing there. So my asymptotes are still going to be both at zero. So if I show my graph, that's what I'm going to get. So when you have a rational function, you just have to take the factors, those are your points, figure out your asymptotes, if it's negative, you're going to reflect, and then you plot your points. Questions? We all understand what a rational graph looks like, the key characteristics. Okay, we'll get in some vocabulary more next time. I want to go over your stock paper. So the handout was just vocabulary. There was a video on YouTube that explained why stocks change. Very important video. Please make sure you watch it.
So the first couple questions were based on this table. It says, which one do you think is overvalued? So you would look at your numbers, your PE ratio is what would be important to calculating that value. Which one of the PE ratio looks out of proportion? No? 55, 19, 24, and 17. Which one looks out of proportion? No? We all know? No idea? Excuse me? Which one looks out of proportion? It says overvalued. Which one looks overvalued? The Mona Lisa one, right? The Mona Lisa one, it's at $52 for your ratio. That's a ridiculous amount when the values are so low otherwise. Hold on, let me just see what that is. No Tyrese? I thought I seen him. Elijah, Caleb, nope. Uh, Maurice? Nobody's here. So is here. Right here, Jocelyn, Pedro, Pierce, and Olivia. Pierce and Olivia, y'all called out today? Uh, yeah, oh, stay away from me, got it. All right, which stock is the most expensive? That is the cost per share. So you're looking at the cost per share you're just answering which one is more expensive. You're reading a table. Which stock seems to be well, you're gonna need your notebook still. Seems to be doing well as compared to the 52 high and low. So you're looking at your high and low and seeing which one increased more, has the greatest increase. Not necessarily the highest price. And how would you use the PE ratio to decide what stocks to purchase? Okay, so this is understanding the charts. Here is where we get into using the formula. So this is a rational equation where they tell you D is the value of the dividend. N is the number of times it's given out a year. P is the proportion of the net income. I is your annual income. And S is the number of outstanding shares. So you're taking this equation Sorry, those on Zoom forgot again. This is far the worst. <clears throat> Let me know if you can't see. Right? So it tells me my percentage is 15%. Hopefully, we all know that 15% looks like 0.15. This is my annual income. Quarterly, what does quarterly mean? How many times a year does quarterly come up? 25. Quarterly. Four. You don't oh, even four. have 25. Four. four. I thought it was a quarter. Uh huh. <laughs> yep. How many quarters are in a whole? Four. Yeah. Okay? And then here's my outstanding shares. So I'm actually just going to substitute in to find my dividend payment. So my dividend is going to be equal to my proportion, which is 15. My I is my something. My annual net income, which is my 32, comma, 0, 0, comma, 0, 0, 0. Times my N, my number of times that share pops up. Times my S, which is my outstanding shares, which is this 7, 750,000. And I'm simply going to simplify these. This is a rational function. The top multiply together, the bottom multiplies together, and then you divide. Do not get in your calculator. 0.15 times 32.2 million divided by four times, you're not gonna get the right order of operations. They have to be grouped together. 
So if you simply put the whole thing in the calculator at the same time, you need the parentheses. If you want to do it in pieces, which I strongly suggest, do it in pieces and then divide. Okay, that's how you use that. <clears throat> I'm gonna go down to where it's asking you something else. How much would the dividend payment be? That's the same thing. Okay, here we go. This one is asking you to take the formula and kind of play with it a little bit. So it's the same formula being used, except now it's asking you what the percentage is. So now you're finding the P. So my dividend is going to be my 0.31. My P, I don't know. It's my percentage, I don't know. My annual net income is going to be my 45,922,000. The number of shares, it says, given out of three equal dividends. So my three is the number of times that share is going to be given out. And then my... S is the number of outstanding shares. So remember that they're groups. This is inverse variation. So if this is I had, right? How would I get that X from the bottom? I would have to multiply by what? If I want to solve for K, if I want to solve for this top piece, what do I have to do? What's the inverse? How do I find that? If that's K divided by X to solve for K, I have to multiply, right? So this would be Y times X equals K. So I'm going to do the same here. I'm going to take this bottom piece and I'm going to multiply to that point 31. However, now this has became direct variation, right? I have backwards though. So I now have a K times X equals a Y. I have a Y equals a K times X. And I'm trying to find my K, which is my P here. So what do I have to do? I want to find this K here. Somebody's about to say it. Somebody's divide. talking. She said divide. She said divide, yep. Right? That's going to equal my K. So now, I'm going to divide this out. So this is going to cancel out here. And I'm going to divide it out by 4, 5, And this is going to get me my P. I know you can't really see that marker. I'll shine it for a different color. So that's what these questions are asking you to do. They're asking you to manipulate this rational function in order to find whatever piece is missing. <clears throat> there is 10 minutes left in class. I would like you to, to do this actual assignment while we are in class so I can answer any questions. Do not just simply put your notebooks away and sit here for 10 minutes.